had said, aphasia, it's not a loss of intelligence. It's a loss of language. And there is a huge difference, huge difference. Welcome to the Stroke Cast. A Generation X stroke survivor explores rehab, recovery, the frontiers of neuroscience, and how to peel a banana with one hand. Hello, I'm Bill Monroe, and welcome to episode 171 of the Stroke Cast. How does remote speech therapy work? This episode is brought to you by the fine folks at Modus Nova. To find out if Modus Nova can help you recover the use of a stroke-affected limb, visit strokecast.com slash Modus Nova. Telemedicine can be a great option for many patients. It saves a huge amount of time and, more importantly, energy. While most providers had to figure out how to offer telemedicine services at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, speech-language pathologist Lenora Edwards and Better Speech had a head start. They'd already been offering speech therapy remotely for years. Lenora joins us today to talk about the advantages and the challenges of conducting speech therapy over the internet. So now, let's meet Lenora Edwards. So Lenora, thanks so much for joining us on the show this week. Thank you so much for having me, Bill. I'm so excited to be here. Awesome. Uh, You know, obviously, the world has changed a lot over the last few years. We're catching up with technology. And so we're going to be talking a lot about just the hybrid nature of speech therapy and really speech communication in general these days. But before we get into that, uh, I I like to go back to the basics with a lot of our, our speech therapists. And besides always pointing out that speech therapy probably has the single worst branding of any of the rehab specialties, uh, (laughs) <laughs> you know, with touching on everything from swallowing to cognitive mm-hmm. challenges, so much beyond just speaking. But uh, let's start off with, can you take us through the uh, the differences uh, between aphasia, apraxia, and dysarthria? You mentioned the speech therapy is a, is a tough branding name, which it can definitely be because I'll even go up to my clients and I'll say, oh, I'm from speech therapy. And they'll say, There's nothing wrong with my speech. And I usually like to tell people that we work from the neck and up. So as a speech language pathologist, we work with people who are working on communication or their memory or their swallowing function. So there's a lot that we go into. So specifically, you asked about aphasia, apraxia, and dysarthria. So aphasia is actually the difficulty of finding your words. So the words that you have might not be coming out as clearly as you'd like them to. With apraxia and dysarthria, they're they're close together, but there is a very distinct difference. With dysarthria, that's much more of a weakness. There's a slurred component. So really the articulators like your lips, your tongue, your jaw, those articulators are not moving as quickly. Their movement is a little different or their strength is a little different. And apraxia is also difficulty actually getting those words to sequence and organize the way that you would like them to. So there's a lot of different parts and it it can be tricky to follow, but that's why you reach out to a speech therapist because we're able to help clarify those things. It's fascinating just how many different elements have to come together and have to work properly for Mm -hmm. us to be able to to, to speak, you know, figuring out what words we want to say, then figuring out how to put them in the right order for our language and grammar, and then to physically move all the different parts of our mouth. And any one of those can fail uh, in a stroke. Absolutely, especially in a stroke. And, and there's so much that goes into it that we don't really think about because we are designed to communicate and we pick up language immediately as we are developing. So, even if you think back to little ones, as they're growing, they're learning and building the world around them with their language. And when somebody has a stroke, what happens is they still have that language. It's just a little more difficult for them to find the information. For example, it might be in the filing cabinet, but now you have to go through all those files to find the information that you would like to effectively communicate. And then you also have to take into the, the respiratory system 
You might have difficulty actually inflating your lungs and having that voice travel through the mouth and the throat muscles so that you can actually execute clear speech with proper respiration. It's it's quite, quite phenomenal how easily it, it we don't think about it. One of the things that's really fascinating is you mentioned how we just pick it up intuitively. I've been seeing more mm -hmm. online about just some of the nature of how we order adjectives in the English language, and we were never taught these rules of grammar. But mm -hmm. for example, many of us as kids may have read the stories of Clifford the Big Red Dog. Just the nature of our language is that size has to come before color, before the noun. So we mm -hmm. could talk about Clifford the Big Red Dog, and that makes sense. If we talk about Clifford the Red Big Dog, people think, what's wrong with you? Mm -hmm. And it's interesting. Your brain actually has to sequence differently to pull up that information. Because if you say big, you've given it a size. But if you say red first, you're now giving it a color. And then if you say dog, so if you start to move those around, your brain actually has to work harder to sequence all that information in a, in a very thorough way. And it can be very fatiguing to the brain when it has to overwork like that. <laughs> And, and to try and figure that out, how to do that as an adult is just, oof, that's, that's, that's a lot of work. It is a lot of work. Absolutely. And, uh, and I think that's why, you know, folks who go to speech therapy, you know, can be exhausted at the end of, at the end of it, because yeah, you know, you're not lifting your body weight the whole time, but you are doing a heck of a lot of brain work. And as you said, with coordinating movements, you're running, moving a heck of a lot of muscles. Because when we think about hemiparesis and uh, one-sided weakness, it's not just the arm and the legs. It's also the jaw and the tongue and the neck and all that that controls those larynx. It's also the core muscles, which support the diaphragm, which feeds into the breathing and all of that. So we're trying to control all of those things with fewer brain cells available to do it. Uh, absolutely. And, and, you know, I, I often will tell my clients that, you know, especially um, new strokes, they don't always understand what's happening, especially with family also. So when I'm working with my clients and when I'm working with their family, I'm trying to explain to them what is actually happening. So, for example, if you went to the grocery store every single day and you took the same exact path, you know that path really, really well you can go back and forth without even thinking about it. Now what happens when you have a stroke, it's as if there's a detour on that very familiar path and your brain has to work harder and harder to find ways to get to that destination, whether it's somebody having difficulty breathing or difficulty breathing and voicing at the same time or breathing, voicing and finding their words. A lot is going on when individuals have strokes and it's absolutely fatiguing for them because it requires a lot of focus and a lot of things going on so that they can effectively communicate their thoughts, their wants, their needs to, to the people around them. And being able to involve uh, more members of the family is, is certainly a benefit. Mm -hmm. So did you start doing then telehealth for speech therapy as part of the pandemic? Or did this uh, sort of predate the COVID lockdowns? Better Speech actually predated the COVID lockdown. So we've been doing it long before the pandemic. And what we're, what was more of a slow progression in the culture of things moving more onto video where telehealth really just hit the speed track and went flying with the pandemic. So we actually, we are, were already established and we were already very, our, all of our therapists were comfortable already knowing how to communicate with people on a remote system and effectively signing in and communicating with them and their families. So we already had a lot of the channels lined up, whereas other people were looking for those channels when, when everything went to, to remote work. Hmm. Yeah. It's amazing how, uh, how quickly everybody had to scramble, but at the same mm -hmm. time, so many employers uh, have been saying for years, no, we can't accommodate your disability need to work remotely. It's too much trouble. We can't do it. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. As soon as the pandemic happened, they suddenly figured out it was <laughs> possible to go ahead and accommodate that. So it opens it, up all sorts of possibilities for folks with disabilities. Absolutely. It really does. And, you know, if you think about even so, say, for example, somebody who had a stroke. 
they're now back in their home environment, but going for therapy can be, aside from the therapy session can be fatiguing, the entire process of going there, the entire process of being in the waiting room and having to wait for your therapist and then transition back into the car, back home, it's quite the process. Whereas now with, with better speech or with you know any therapy that's online, you're already in the convenience of your home. This is so, so beautifully convenient. And for better speech, we're incredibly affordable, which is an, an extra massive bonus on top of that. Because when you want the therapy services, or even if your insurance decided to not cover a large chunk of it or whatever the case may be, we're already there. We're already affordable for speech therapy services. And that's a huge thing. When you need those services, you don't want to wait for us, for our clients. They don't wait months to be seen by a speech language pathologist. Hmm. They get seen the next day. That's how phenomenal better speeches and telehealth has become because we have that ability now. There's no more waiting, which is great. Yeah, definitely. That that certainly has has a big advantage when you can go from, like you said, just the, the logistics of attending an on-site uh, mm -hmm. therapy encounter. It might be a 45-minute appointment, but that's going to take three hours of your day in order to do that. Plus, you, you probably have to put on pants, too. So. <laughs> 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 Typically, yes. Yeah. But the nice thing is with with uh, remote work, you, you, you're you already home and you're comfortable and you show up where you are. And, and it's that's a really incredible luxury that wasn't available for us before. And especially wanted to be seen post-stroke. Time is of the essence. You really want to get that rehab and there, there, we don't want you to wait and there shouldn't be waiting. Now, of course, obviously the advantages of, uh, of, of patients being able to be anywhere. I mean, therapists can be mm -hmm. anywhere as well. Opens up all sorts of possibilities. Mm -hmm. One of the challenges we've encountered, uh, I've encountered in talking with other medical professionals who've had to make the transition to hybrid is mm -hmm. verifying or confirming that the patient is in the proper physical state of the U.S. in order to mm -hmm. receive services because we've had – we've had uh, talked to doctors who have patients traveling and maybe mm -hmm. they're in Washington. Their patient is traveling to Idaho. Oh, they have to cancel the appointment because they're not licensed in Idaho. Mm -hmm. How do you manage then all of these cross-state licensing issues and restrictions, which really should be meaningless, but are are still legal impediments to caring for folks wherever they are? That is such a phenomenal question. And it really is one that can be tricky to navigate. For us at Better Sweet, at Better Speech, we are licensed individually. So for example, I am licensed in five states. So if my patient in Pennsylvania that I currently live in travels to Florida, I am licensed in that state by the board of the of, by the board of Florida that says I can practice in Florida. So that's not a problem. Now, for example, if, if they transition to a state that I am not licensed in at Better Speech, we already have that covered. We have therapists that are licensed in the states across the US and we're also international. So we reach out to as many or whoever reaches to us we have that ability to cover them. So say they transition to Idaho and I don't live there. I have the ability to transfer that case and they have continuity of care because there's, there's no gap in that time frame. So if I, they left my state one week, the next week when they get seen for therapy, they're still followed up with the same company, the same billing codes that are provided. And those notes go with them to a therapist that's licensed in that state. But that's a great, great thing because that's continuity of care. That's continuing care. That's exactly what they want. And does it still work for folks who are just traveling on vacation and maybe not doing a permanent relocation to be able to switch therapists based on where they happen to be at the time? I would probably say it's circumstantial. You know, if they were just going away for vacation, they actually have the ability to log into their account on betterspeech.com and they can just simply pause the therapy services and we would have given them a home program to practice while they are apart from, from the clinician. That's another great thing is that in clinics right now, you might not have the ability to have family members come into the clinic or they might not be able to go into the therapy room with you. When you're remote doing therapy on Zoom, they, as many people as that are in the family that want to be there can listen, can participate in that therapy session 
and they're they're all getting this information to help the individual that is seeking the, the therapy treatment. Hmm. Or, of course, the individual can kick them out of the room. <laughs> that too. <laughs> that is possible if they would like. <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, there's definitely a lot of advantages there, but there are, of course, the challenges. I mean, how do you treat something like dysphagia, the, uh, the, the, chal- the problems of swallowing, uh, remotely when you can't be there with a patient to assess them directly or make sure they're not choking on their ice chips? That's a great question. In that case, we do have, because we are able to visually have eyes on them when they're on Zoom, and in the event that somebody has difficulty swallowing, if somebody's with them or they're able to it work with us and follow our directions, what we're actually doing is we're, we're walking them through. So just because I can't physically touch somebody and feel their, their swallow timing or their movement of their larynx doesn't mean I can't treat them. And I actually am able to provide them with more information and because they can easily see me and I can pull up videos, I can pull up pictures for them to see what it, what it looks like, not their exact swallowing mechanism, but what the swallowing mechanism looks like and what we're targeting. So if they're having difficulty with a sandwich, say they say, okay, well, I would like to practice with a sandwich today, even though before it was giving me difficulty, but I'm with you now, I'd like to really work on this. What we're doing is we're helping them understand how to effectively chew, how to effectively transfer that bolus. Then what other strategies to implement so that they can eat safely uncomfortably. And that's a great thing because they're able to demonstrate for themselves in that moment, oh, I can do this. This is what they're saying. And we can even send them information or they can write information down of their strategies so that they have that visual reminder in front of them when they're eating. So that's great for helping them to succeed with that. Uh, Mm -hmm. I imagine when they, they fail with those goals, it becomes a little more challenging not being able to help somebody who may be sort of starting to choke in that process. Mm -hmm. In in that process, yes, that would be, you know, because if if we're going to that more of an extreme situation where somebody's choking, I don't have the ability to give them the Heimlich. However, thankfully, I'm, I'm happy to report that hasn't happened. And in the event that they are that, in, in that much of a fragile state that they might not have gone home by themselves in that very specific situation. You know, when somebody goes to a rehab setting, there there are specific lines set up that say, okay, this person is safe to go home. And if they go against medical advice, that is their right. But we have certain guidelines in place when we transition people from the hospital to a rehab setting or a rehab setting to a home setting who else is there to support them now, whether they have better speech, which comes in remotely, or if they have a home health program that comes in physically into the home, there's a lot of different things, but in more often than not, our, our individuals are quite safe and that's exactly what we want. We want to ensure their safety more than anything. So a lot of it is, it's not that uh, something like a better speech is going to be perfect for each and every scenario. There's going to be a lot of variability uh, where it makes it, where it's a great solution to be remote. That's fantastic. And Mm -hmm. where a solution we need somebody with, and there are still some, not nearly as many as we used to think there are, but there are still some that require dedicated in-person experiences. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, that's a great point. That's like with anything, you know, there, there are times where, it is completely appropriate to have a remote situation and there's times where it's completely appropriate to have an in-person therapist. And again, it depends on that person's level of care that they they need and their, their level of safety. That's a phenomenal point. Probably less of a, of, a, of a safety concern. Some folks who may have some executive processing challenges or cognitive challenges after stroke how does your treatment approach change with those folks remotely when it may be more challenging to sort of redirect somebody or have somebody engage with the technology, which is something you don't have to do in an in-person context, engage with the technology directly? That's a really great point about engaging and being able to sequence through, especially when the individuals that are having strokes, I have a variety of people that have never used a smartphone and I have 
a plenty of people that have used a smartphone. So it really just depends on that person, but it also depends on the type of stroke that they had to see if they're appropriate to literally be able to know how to use the application so that they can open the email or they can go to betterspeech.com and connect to that Zoom profile so that we can then start our therapy session. So it would really be important for them to be able to maneuver through that situation, if not have somebody there so that they can effectively use technology. That is absolutely important. When it comes to other things like um, functions such as managing your medication or finances, those are things that I, I absolutely do work on with my clients because it's really important for them to be able to read the label, understand what medication they're having, what medication it's for, literally why are they taking that medication, how frequently do they need to eat with it. Those are other complex things that we, again, kind of take for granted. But once we have a stroke, those are things that really we want to make sure that they're able to safely do on their own. And if not, who else is there? Who can help? And that reminds me, I have to take my uh, my morning pills after our call. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so how has treating folks then with aphasia and with a word finding and, and speaking, how is that different online versus in a clinic setting? So in clinic versus online, they're, they're not very... They're not too, too different unless you're playing a game of which we have games online that we can play with. Um, what you, The goal is, can they take what they learn in therapy, whether it is in person or it is online? Can they take what they learned in therapy and implement it in their life, which is a great thing as to why the family can be present or friends, whomever else is with them. The half hour or whether it's a half hour or an hour a week that I get to spend with somebody I'm helping that person, but I'm also training those individuals that are with that person and I'm training that person to use these techniques when we're not there. How can they make it functional? How can they implement it in their life? So I'll tell my clients, okay, so what I want you to do as you on a commercial, if you're, if you're going to watch TV on a commercial, mute it. And I want you to look around the room and I want you to try and name items within the room. And then I want you to try and use them in a sentence. And that's a very high functioning task. And it depends on who, who I'm working with that I would give that task to, that homework assignment to. But they absolutely, that's something that they can do in the middle. That's a home program. In the middle of working with a clinician, that's how they're carrying through to make it functional. So whether I train them in person or, in, or remotely, either way, we're always working to implement that technique, those strategies in their life so that they can have that ability to communicate. So it can make things a little bit more contextual. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So for example, if I wanted somebody to, if somebody said, Hey, I really like reading books. And I said, okay, great. What is it that we want to target? Where are we in our ability to read books? If they tell me they like to read the newspaper, then I'll go and I'll work with them on the newspaper. It's not like I'm going to give them, say, if they tell me, oh, I never play board games. I'm not going to pull out a board game. That's not very <laughs> functional for them. If they tell me, I really like books, great. Let's start with the reading passages. Let's see where we are. Because, again, I'm not going to ask them to do something that they weren't doing before. That doesn't make any sense, and that's not functional for them. Right, right. It's like it's like the IT, uh, the the OTs never uh, spend time with me teaching me how to swing a golf club because I really never cared about swinging a golf there club. There's absolutely no point to that, unless I'm expect I'm expressing rage at somebody, which is not something you want to encourage. Uh, <laughs> Definitely not with a golf club in the hand. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, so and and reading is an interesting thing too because as we've moved more into this hybrid environment with these different platforms, the chat box on Zoom or Teams or whatever other platform becomes another avenue of communication. Has mm -hmm. the typing and the chat functionality along with some of these other virtual types of communication, has that impacted type of treatment you provide and the way your folks, uh, your patients are communicating with others? Absolutely. And when I, when I go to see somebody, whether it be remotely or in person, one of the first questions I ask are you using a phone? Because 
Texting is how people are communicating a lot of the time or even sending an email. So that's really important. Can they navigate through their phone and how's their spelling? Are they able to get across what they want to get across? Now, for example, say somebody had a stroke and they had a lot of difficulty texting. Literally, let's say maybe their dominant hand wasn't working but or wasn't working as well, but they're able to effectively communicate. I will then train them on how to take video, how to take audio. So that way they can still communicate and send information to whether it be their doctor or their family. But it is absolutely important that they know how to use devices. So whether it's in the chat box and they're using a full-blown keyboard with two hands on a computer or are they using just their thumbs to text, it's absolutely a, a primary concern. I, I, I would venture to say of almost any speech language pathologist, how can they communicate, whether it is through writing or text message or verbal, how are they communicating? Because we communicate in so many ways. Our nonverbals are a way of communication. So how are they communicating in that standpoint? There's just, there's a lot that goes into it, which is why each treatment plan or each plan of care is specific to the individual because one thing will not fit for everybody. And it shouldn't. We're all individual. And and that's really interesting, too. When you start talking about texting for of, at, at a couple of levels, for one thing, I, I know one thing I have found and that I think is new to a lot of folks in, in stroke world is that as we've seen, phones have gotten bigger, which is awesome for our eyesight. If you've got mm-hmm. hemiparesis, a phone with a screen bigger than six inches mm-hmm. is seriously problematic for using because you you can't easily cover the entire thing with the fu- the one functional thumb that you thumb. have. So I always tell mm-hmm. people, look for screens five and a half inches or smaller, if at all possible. Mm-hmm. The other thing that's really interesting about that is that text messaging itself, broader, broader more broadly speaking, culturally, uh, and its offshoot of the or going back to the AOL chat rooms back in the day has really evolved into its own language mm-hmm. as well. So we have our spoken language, we have our typical written language, and now we have our text language with its abbreviations and with, you know, things like ROTFL, which nobody says out loud. Nobody says what it actually mm-hmm. stands for out loud. We just know what it means when we when we text it now. Absolutely. That's a great point. Or LOL, BRB, completely. Mm-hmm. And these are things that people want to be able to understand. Say, for example, somebody had a stroke and they're like, well, what does this mean? My my friend just sent this to me and it says BRT, be right there. And that that individual might not know. So there really is so much that goes into our language. We're constantly communicating. It's never not happening. And it's important that people who have strokes still have that ability not only do they do they know that they have the ability to communicate, the people around them need to understand that they still have the ability to communicate. And when they have aphasia or they have a praxia or dysarthria, whatever it may be, it is not a loss of intelligence. And that is something that has always stuck out to me. There, I re- even remember in graduate school, and I'm going back a while now, and it had said aphasia, it's not a loss of intelligence, it's a loss of language. And there is a huge difference huge difference. And people shouldn't be dismissed because they might not understand immediately. They just need a little bit of time or assistance to understand. Yeah, absolutely. And and that is, that is so important point we keep coming back to. It's that you haven't lost your thoughts. You haven't lost your feelings. You haven't lost your emotions. You haven't lost your cognitive, your thinking process. All that's still there. Mm-hmm. You just lost access to the words. And mm-hmm. the first thing, so the first thing I imagine folks have to learn is that, yes, there is a difference between your thoughts and your, inte- uh, your language and your intelligence. And mm-hmm. culturally, uh, we have a lot of baggage around that because we associate having being intelligent with having a large vocabulary. The mm-hmm. SATs and ACT tests that we take to get into college have a huge vocabulary component, and they're often used as a stand-in for an IQ test or for an intelligence test. And they're not actually measuring that. They're measuring your access to your words. That's a beautiful point, especially in culturally. Um, you know, having our language is a huge part, especially it's important. And I, and I feel like uh, as an adult who's in my 30s now, there is a huge difference uh, in younger 
people because they're using only texts or not only, but they're, they're favoring uh, text messages over actual verbal communication. And that can be hard for somebody who had a stroke also, because they're now they have a new level of, of time that they have to process through communicating with somebody who's younger that might not carry a conversation and it can actually confuse the person with the stroke even more. The other thing that of course has grown up a lot over the last 10 years or so has been the increased use of emojis and other symbolic elements Mm -hmm. in it coming into the English language, which, yeah, there is some dispute over what a specific emoji might mean, but generally they can add a lot more nuance to written communication and to text messages that that gets lost when we lose the verbal component. Mm -hmm. But in your experience, have you seen that use of emojis is helpful or more harmful for folks with aphasia in understanding or communicating that which they want to communicate? That's a really phenomenal question. And I don't, when when they're aphasic and having difficulty texting, sometimes the use of emojis, thumbs up, thumbs down, smiley face, sad face, that can be really effective because they're very clear. Other ones, when you start to get into it, then you're starting to to get more into AAC devices or devices that will help communicate those emotions, will help communicate those, those images that they're wanting to express if their verbal communication is no longer coming through. When it comes to a lot of my clients, when they're receiving emojis, they're usually okay. And I think it it might simply be the adults that have understood, oh, yeah, that that pretty much looks like a happy face or that pretty much looks like a sad face. I haven't seen any or an angry face, an angry emoji. I haven't seen where they're not really understanding that emotion. And if they, if it's not, they're, they're not really using that smart device. So it's not, necessarily a major issue right now because there's other things that are taking precedent before the emojis are coming in. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. I've, you know, I've been encountering it among uh, some folks with, without aphasia on, uh, mm-hmm. on the ask a manager website, there was uh, a discussion about somebody who used an emoji in a work communication, which was the emoji, which has a face with what appears to be steam coming out of the nose. Okay. Somebody okay. sent that saying it, it, to indicate, yep, I'm working hard. Uh, hard work, breathing really hard, like, you know, sort of locomotive with okay. steam coming out. The person who got it perceived it as somebody was really angry at angry. them. Mm. So, so, so very it's, interesting. It's, it's a fascinating space. And perhaps some yeah. of this is culturally among our friends group. The, the praise mm-hmm. hands emoji also, uh, praise emoji also mm-hmm. causes confusion among po- folks. So uh, I, I, I don't know very much here. So I, I think it's just, Interesting to start exploring this. Absolutely. I'm going to have to ask more folks with aphasia about their experience with yes. this. Yes, I'd be very interested to hear more about that because I could see how both are interpreted that way. Absolutely. <laughs> um, very interesting. Yeah. And, and I think that that's one of those things that is so beautiful about language is that our language shapes our reality and our reality shapes our language. And it all mm-hmm. all comes together into this whole thing that hopefully makes our lives better. Hopefully, yes, absolutely. I always find that there's there's language, and then there's a whole other language being said. <laughs> so it's it's very very interesting. I I'm fascinated by language, and I can talk with people all day long about it. Absolutely. <laughs> so, I mean, is this a uh, fascinating fascination with language? Something you've always had since uh, growing since growing up in Brooklyn, or has <laughs> it? Or, or how is it that you, you chose to come into speech therapy? That's a great question. And, and you know, it, especially um, growing up in Brooklyn, we, as you well know, we're growing up in New York. Every place has its own dialect, has mm-hmm. its own local language. And that's a very, very true statement. Um, you know, even how they pronounce a word. I lived in Scranton, Pennsylvania for a period of time. And the, some of the people that I knew would say apple and others would say apple or it was scranton or scranton and mm-hmm. they, all they did was 
change the the vowel of the sound and it just completely changed how you heard the word and how you, how you thought like, oh, that person must be local or, oh, that person must not be local. <laughs> so it's just very, very interesting. When I went to college in Montana uh, during orientation week, I was paired up with somebody from Texas for a game of Pictionary. And mm. we, we, we got into a bit of an argument over something I was drawing because uh, the word we were trying to come up with was uh, for an injury, saw, S-O-R-E. E. Oh. And so I naturally drew the homophone, the tool you use for cutting wood, an S A W, mm -hmm. because saw, saw, and saw, mm -hmm. are, it's the same pronunciation. <laughs> she disagreed. I would, I would imagine so. <laughs> See, it's just, it's so wildly fascinating. And I, I'm a hundred percent Italian. I've always loved talking and and getting to know people. So communication was just a very or, and going into speech therapy was very natural for me. Very, very natural. I, I couldn't have told you like, oh, I want to be a speech therapist. But the, the more I became educated as I went through college, I thought, I was like, this is quite interesting. Let me explore more of this. And that's fascinating, too. When we start talking about alternative communications, you know, when I grew up in Queens and in an Irish Catholic family, as opposed to the uh, New York Italian families, we, we tended to not gesture as widely. But that gesture, which becomes highly localized and culturalized, also becomes an element of language. Mm hmm. Absolutely. So those the, the nonverbals that I was mentioning earlier, you know, how we how we furrow brow, how we you know, raise, even raising eyebrows or using our body to communicate what we're feeling, what we're expressing. And there are people who can sit there with their hands folded and say, I'm very angry. And then there's other people who are very, very wide and, and really expressive of that anger. It just depends on the person and, and how they communicate with their body, with their nonverbals. And then when you factor stroke into that, now you've got hemiparesis impacting mm -hmm. your ability to gesture and to control your nonverbals as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then when, um, you know, when there is a stroke involved, they're also feeling things very, very differently. They have a different chemical balance in their body. They have a different level of understanding also. And it can actually make somebody become angrier faster because their their brain is getting so taxed and they don't understand why they don't understand the information. And it can be very, very difficult for them. So anybody who, who has experienced a stroke or anybody who knows anybody that has a stroke really have patience with them because there's so much more going on and they're not doing it on purpose. And that could be said for anybody with anybody or any individual who's experiencing something. You know, I work with people who have dementia and they're not trying to be nasty. They just don't understand. And this is how it's coming out. It's like there's something wrong in their brain. Mm. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, I, you know, I know when I was, especially in the early days, I was living with a lot more of the emotional lability, which made me just prone to tear up at, you know, even just physical exertion. It was really interesting to start displaying these emotions, which, of course, makes everybody uncomfortable because I'd always been a fairly stoic person. And it's like you start crying, but you're not actually sad or Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's just these different physical manifestations and the way these things come out. So even when uh, a particular emotional display might communicate something pre-stroke, it may be communicating something entirely different after stroke. Absolutely. That's a phenomenal, phenomenal point. And, you know, especially when you had mentioned that your emotions are all over the map, it's very true. And Again, they like you mentioned, it might not be sadness. It's just coming out. And, you know, I think crying is actually quite misunderstood because crying is just simply it's it's another part of your nervous system that is trying to release whatever it may be. And whether that release is coming out in sweats or that release is coming out in tears or that release is coming out in in anger, whatever it is, it's the system needs to do it. The nervous system needs to do it. And it's it's some um, people do get very uncomfortable and it's nothing to be uncomfortable about. It's a very normal, normal process. And it's proof that the system is working and doing its best. 
it's just amazing how the system adapts and just finds whatever solution it can to do mm-hmm. what it needs to do. Now, I, I know I interrupted you when you were talking about your experience in <laughs> Scranton. So why speech a, a path, a choosing a, a path in SLP instead of, say, a path into linguistics, another just extremely fascinating space? Absolutely. It is completely fascinating. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I actually did have a linguistics class and it just happened to be more what I was drawn to about learning. There was, I think I have an appreciation for linguistics much more now at this point in my life than I did when I was in my early twenties going through, going through graduate school. So it's the beautiful thing about the field of speech language pathology is that there's so much we can do. There's so many different avenues whether it being working with somebody on cognitive skills or swallowing skills or helping little ones clearly communicate the R sound. It's just, it goes on and on or using communication devices. And it's, if you kind of look at it as a whole, helping people communicate, that's what's most important. We're we're humans, we're designed to communicate and being able to give somebody that ability to communicate in any fashion is a phenomenal gift. It's it's incredible to watch. And and it empowers our ability to interact with one another, which is ultimately key to uh, the happiness for for most of us in Mm -hmm. in this world. Absolutely. Beautifully said, Bill. And that brings us to our hack of the week. But first, let's talk about sponsor Modus Nova. The Modus Nova system helps stroke survivors recover the use of a stroke-affected limb while the user plays video games. The air-powered, AI-controlled exoskeleton of the arm or foot uses advanced sensor technology to help with a very simple goal. Get more repetitions in for the stroke survivor. We know the key to recovering the use of a limb is repetition. More therapy, more exercises. The more we repeat a motion and challenge ourselves to do that motion faster or with greater strength, the more likely we are to build those pathways in our brains. The modus hand and modus foot help us do just that. Help us get those exercises in as we play those games. To find out if Modus Nova can help you recover the use of a stroke-affected limb, visit strokecast.com slash Modus Nova. Use promo code strokecast for 10% off your first month. And now back to our hack of the week. Have patience. Have Allow yourself patience. Allow those around you to be patient with you. And especially as somebody who people naturally want to help you, And sometimes that might not always be the best thing. So say, for example, you were the person that had the stroke and you're trying to communicate that you want something to drink. As somebody who's the listener in my position, I would be the listener. You'd be the the expressor. You'd be the one that's communicating. I might find the need to try and guess in rapid fire what you're wanting and trying to fill it in. Do you want a blanket? Do you want to do what? Do you need a tissue? Do you need a pen? Do you need a phone? rather than just having patience and allowing you the time to process, allowing you the time to find the word on your own. And if you would like some help, I'm there. If not, I will wait as long as you'd need me to, for you to find that information so that you can effectively communicate. Because as you, the client that's doing it, or as you, the person that had the stroke, you're working to find your language again. And you're also working to have that autonomy that says, I can communicate for myself. I can take care of myself and communicate my wants, my needs, my thoughts. As the listener, having patience and being supportive of that is absolutely completely beneficial because you're not bombarding that person with information. If they're trying to think of one word and you're sending in 10, 15 other pieces of information to them, including the tone of my voice, including the rapid fire that I'm talking to you, sending in so much information is a lot to sort through. So always have patience. Uh, and, and if they're the person that had the stroke, it's okay to ask for help. And as the per- as the other person waiting to hear what you say, I can always say, if you need help, I'm here. And just wait. Allowing that space is also really great. But then if they want help, 
moving into different strategies is always really helpful. Some people benefit from just getting two choices. Other people are okay with getting five choices. Other people are wanting to gesture. So it really just depends on that person and where they are for those strategies to be implemented. Well, that's great. Uh, and, and that's that's always a, a really great perspective as the previous interview I just did. They also cited uh, patients in a different context in working with folks with physical challenges, which is always mm. fascinating. The other thing I think that's so important is, like you said, that whole be available for assistance, but don't insist on providing the assistance right away. I had an instant incident in the uh, Virgin Islands. Uh, I was on a cruise and was walking around and I took a moment to pause at a place where we were going to, I guess, get back on the boat or something. You know how we're used to have, they have these metal bollards in parking lots that usually are sunk a couple of uh, feet down and they're removable and stuff. And so we, so you can lean against that and it's not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. in, in this case, it wasn't actually sunk into the ground. It was just sort of, just sort of sitting there. And so I leaned on it. And of course I went right down. And oh then immediately my. the folks who are around, they're trying to help me up. And mm -hmm. that is the last thing I need them to do. And I'm trying to tell people, don't help me, don't help me, don't help mm -hmm. me. And other people are like as well, because if you don't know how to help, you're grabbing my affected mm -hmm. arm, which could be subluxing. And that's just going to make things worse. So mm -hmm. offer assistance and respect it when it's declined. Yes, that's beautifully, beautifully said, <laughs> truly. So, uh, Lenora, this has been this has been great. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, if folks want to know more about fun. you and what you're up to and and uh, better spe ed speech, uh, I mean, where should they go? Betterspeech.com is a great place to to start. We are there, and there's always somebody there to to communicate with, and we can get you scheduled immediately for those speech therapy services. And I'm sure there will also be some links below this podcast so that you can reach out to us. And, um, you know, if even if you have questions, we offer a free 15 minute consultation so that we can help guide individuals on where they are, if they need speech therapy services, or if they would like to speak with a speech language pathologist, that is absolutely a possibility at any point in time. So be sure to reach out to us. Fantastic. And uh, I also understand you are always looking to add more speech therapists uh, to your network. Always. We have over 150 therapists and each of us have more than 10 years of experience and we're certified and licensed in different states. So that's something that we're exceptionally proud of. And we have over 4.7 stars on our five star review. So the quality of care that we're providing is outstanding. And that is also something we're exceptionally proud of. Fantastic. And if you're a therapist, apparently it's an opportunity to go to Bali as well. So there you go. There is. <laughs> uh, so, Lenora, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been fantastic. Thank you so much for your time, Bill. It's been great speaking with you. In basic communications classes, the first thing students will learn is that communication is the process by which shared understanding is created. Language is such an important and fascinating thing. Often, it's the tool to create that shared understanding. Ultimately, though, language with its structures and grammar and spelling is still subordinate to the ultimate goal, that shared understanding. The evolutions we see in slang and jargon based on age, the conventions and text messaging, the melding of languages that arise in bi or multilingual communities reveal just how fluid this world can be. And as folks with aphasia and other language challenges know, sometimes language itself may fail and we ultimately need to pursue different communication strategies. Lenora and colleagues help folks develop strategies to communicate more effectively, to create more of that shared understanding. And the remote nature of this work opens services up to so many more people. And it lets more survivors communicate and celebrate their wins. I also want to just take a quick moment and say congratulations to Senator-elect John Fetterman. For those who don't know, Senator-elect uh, Fetterman was running for the Senate in the state of Pennsylvania here in the United States. He suffered a stroke uh, just a few months ago in the middle of the campaign, 
took some time out to do some work on his recovery and got back on the campaign trail despite audio processing and some language challenges. And despite a very vicious campaign involving all sorts of ableist attacks, the voters in Pennsylvania chose to send him to the Senate in January. So regardless of your politics, this is a great example of things that are still possible after stroke and how you can still pursue your goals and pursue your dreams, not only for yourself, but for your community by continuing to work at it and to set your goals and to target them and then to do it. Congratulations again, Senator Fetterman. This is a victory not only for you, but for everyone in the stroke community. And speaking of celebrating wins, do you have a win, large or small, that you'd like to share with the community? I want to hear about it. It could be speech, mobility, balance, or any other post-stroke win in your life. Just call 321-5-STROKE to record a message, and I may share it on a future episode of StrokeCast. We want to celebrate with you, big or small. So call 321-5-STROKE or just email a recording to bill at strokecast.com. To learn more about Lenora and Better Speech, head over to strokecast.com slash better speech or check the show notes in whatever app you're using to listen to this episode. Share this episode with someone you know by giving them the link strokecast.com slash better speech. Share a recent win with the community by calling 321-5-STROKE. And of course, as always, don't get best, get better. Thanks a lot. I'm Bill Monroe, and I'll talk to you soon. The Strokecast, Bill Monroe, and Bill's guests provide general information and entertainment, not medical advice. Please do not make any changes to your treatment plan or the execution of your treatment plan without first consulting your personal doctor or medical team. The Strokecast is a proud production of the Currently Speaking Podcast Network.